Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the extraordinary life of parapsychologist, mystic, and scientist Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama. My guest is Professor Thomas Brody, who is the president of the California Institute of Human Science, founded by Dr. Motoyama. Professor Brody is also the author of numerous books, including The Mechanism Demands a Mysticism, or Explorations of Spirit, Matter, and Physics. He is also author of several books regarding uh, ancient culture of Africa and Egypt, including The Origin Map, a prehistoric megalithic astrophysical map of the universe, and two books co-authored with Robert Boval, including African Genesis, the Prehistoric Origins of Ancient Egypt, and Imhotep the African, Architect of the Cosmos. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for coming to Albuquerque. My pleasure. Uh, as you know, I knew Dr. Motoyama. I corresponded with him. I wrote about him in 1975 in my first book, The Roots of Consciousness. I was very inspired by the work that he did. I regarded him as an, a very significant pioneer in the field of parapsychology. And you obviously knew him and worked with him. Absolutely. He was a very significant figure in... Uh, in the history of this field, I think, really, mm -hmm. and uh, and now in uh, in integral education with uh, the California Institute for Human Science that was founded by uh, uh, Dr. Motiyama. Mm -hmm. Well, he bridged so many different areas. Uh, many people are interested in the chakras, for example, and when it comes to scientific investigation of the chakras, I think he did more than any other researcher of uh, of whom I'm aware. Uh, he was also, as I understand it, a, a yogi, a yogic practitioner, uh, a deep yogic practitioner, and a Shinto priest. Yes, he was very much a practitioner and teacher of of yoga, yogic practices, as well as a uh, scholar, and uh, he really combined uh, those those areas. Uh, I thought I could, I might mention uh, a little bit about his uh, upbringing and his mm -hmm. life, and uh, maybe I could start though with a little story about, like you said, the the um, the relevance of his work. A lot of your listeners have probably um, uh, heard of the Kyoto Prizes, a very significant prize uh, given by the Kyoto Foundation that, that's for scientific research, and it, it's considered almost as prestigious as like the uh, Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, a little bit more humanistically oriented, perhaps. Uh, and the uh, Kyoto Prizes were founded by a man named uh, Mr. Inamori, who was a well-known industrialist who founded uh, Kyocera Corporation, uh, uh, but a very significant grant funded these Kyoto Prizes, hum Humanitarian and Science Kyoto Prizes, and uh, Mr. Inamori was a student of Dr. Motiyama. Oh. They wrote a book together, and uh, it, it's not translated in English, but it, it's so uh, popular in Japan. It, it's titled roughly, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And uh, that, that's just one example of the kind of influence that Dr. Motiyama ha had in the world, I mm -hmm. think. And, and uh, those of us who work at CIHS, the school, uh, we're always finding out about new associations, new things that Dr. Motiyama had that we didn't even know about and, and the importance of his, his life. Mm -hmm. so. now you yourself uh, actually studied in Japan. Yes. Yeah. He invited me uh, in 1995 to uh, uh, study with him at his institute in Japan uh, for a month on a uh, sort of a fellowship that he called the Motoyama Bentov Fellowship, named after his friend, uh, Yitzhak Bentov, a physicist who, uh, who published a, a 
kind of an important little book called uh, Stalking the Wild Pendulum. Yes. He, Bentoff was very early, early modern interest, uh, interested phys physicist in the integration of science and spirituality. And uh, he was a friend of Dr. Motiyama's and uh, mm -hmm. Bentoff died tragically, relatively young, in a plane crash, and so Dr. Motiyama had this little fellowship named after him. A very tragic uh, accident, and uh, many people mourned the loss of Yitzhak Bentoff at the time. Well, one of the things that you pointed out to me, which I think is interesting for uh, students of parapsychology, and many of our viewers are, uh, is that Dr. Motoyama studied and worked with J.B. Rhine uh, in Durham, North Carolina. Yes. Dr. Motoyama had basically a, uh, a postdoctoral research fellowship uh, at the Rhine Institute, uh, whatever exact it was exactly called at the time, at yeah. Duke University. Rhine left Duke, as I recall, in 65 and set up the Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man outside of uh, Durham. And I, I presume that's probably where Dr. Motoyama was. Yes, I think so. And uh, yeah, Dr. Motoyama, he remembered that, uh, that experience and worked very fondly. And that was a time when he got some funding to travel to uh, to India and uh, other locations, I think the Philippines, uh, with instrumentation where he studied yogis in meditative practices uh, to measure their physiological uh, physiological processes mm -hmm. while they're doing in deep meditation. And today, he's probably most remembered for uh, a device that he designed for that purpose. Yes, he developed, he invented a device called AMI, Apparatus for Meridian Identification, which is, uh, it's a, it's an electrophysiological device that measures the, uh, uh, physiological response of the skin to a small voltage, uh, applied at 28 acupuncture points, the Jingwell points at the ends of the fingers and toes. And, uh, his, his, the AMI's, uh, uh, innovation is the analysis of the the uh, early onset of the current in response to the voltage, and mm -hmm. so uh, that's uh, so that's uh, the advance that measures that is correlated with, according to the theory, the functioning of the chi meridians, chi meridian system of those acupuncture meridians. And uh, as as I recall, he was also looking at the voltage. Uh, differential between the uh, right side and the left side of the body. Yes. So finger for finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, this the MI device. It's standardized to measure every time all all twenty eight of these uh, Jingma points. And so uh, there's a uh, baseline of of measures against which <clears throat> the unique measure you know is is is. Uh, 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 measured and those that can then be analyzed, uh, for, uh, multiple, multiple things, mm -hmm. uh, left, right balance, up or lower balance, and basically any kind of, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. uh, diagnostic method. It's, it's an assessment device. It's mm -hmm. not a medical, uh, diagnostic device. It's a research device. Yeah. But because it measures, the correlates of qi activity of the meridian system, you can use traditional Chinese medicine type diagnosis. With it. And, you know, th this was at a time uh, in the late 60s, early 1970s, that Westerners were just be beginning to become aware of uh, the field of acupuncture. And uh, for the most part, people thought, well, this is just some sort of ancient superstition. It, it, totally unrelated to Western medicine. But here is a man trained as a Western scientist coming up with empirical verification of this ancient meridian system and also correlating it with health conditions. Yes, yes, exactly. And that was uh, Motiyama's uh, central research focus mm -hmm. <clears throat> to demonstrate the, uh, the existence of the subtle body such as the meridian system. That's used in uh, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, and it was it was very early work, and we've really come a long way in the West. You know, 
Uh, acupuncture is now an accepted practice. There, you can become licensed acupuncturist in many states. And uh, there was a uh, there was a conference on uh, called Towards a Science of Acupuncture. It was a two day conference uh, about year two thousand held at UC Irvine. And it was funded by the National Science Fund, the National Institutes of Health, and the National Academy of Sciences, because uh, there was a, a wonderful little paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is which is uh, which papers are authored by members of the NAS uh, that showed uh, correlates of. Uh, brain activity through functional MRI, which was kind of new for research then, uh, with, uh, with the particular acupuncture point stimulus that traditional Chinese medicine was said was correlated with that. So, so you know, these very conventional-minded uh, scientists, National Institutes of Health and National Academy of Sciences uh, said, hey, let's, let's have a little conference to study this. Mm -hmm. And I attended that conference. It was uh, really uh, wonderful to see this progress. And there was, there were like two consensuses at that conference. One consensus was that, uh, acupuncture does work, uh, demonstrably, demonstrably, uh, especially for analgesia and even in animal studies. <clears throat> so that was a consensus. Acupuncture does work in some, in some ways, in some, in some cases for some things. And the other consensus was that there was no physiological correlate of acupuncture points. And so I thought, you know, coming from uh, Emotoyama CIHS, that this is a really seminal conference. From these two scientific consensuses, they're go going to realize, well, hey, if there's no physical anatomical correlates, of acupuncture points, but acupuncture works. Maybe uh, there is, maybe the traditional Chinese medicine system of a non-physical qi energy act interacting with the physical body is going to be investigated. Sadly, that didn't happen, though. The, <laughs> the funding authorities, uh, at the end of the conference, they said, okay, this is a great conference, uh, good results. We're going to fund studies that will show how acupuncture works as an artifact of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I do know there was some progress looking at the um, production of endorphins in the brain as a result of acupuncture stimulation. Y yeah, I think I think that's one of the categories of studies that prove that show that it does work. You can you can measure endorphins increase in the brain. You uh, stimulate the acupuncture points. Mm -hmm. But Motoyama was actually, uh, through these el physiological, electrophysiological measurements, uh, suggesting something much more than that, that the idea of qi energy circulating in the body began to make some sense. And I, I gather that at your institute now, you have maintained a focus on research on what uh, people call subtle energy. Yeah, that's right. So, you can call this field of research generally subtle energies research. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's very much a, a part of CIHS's focus at this, uh, at this time still. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had a uh, wonderful doctoral dissertation project. Uh, uh, one of our students uh, completed uh, well, he is completing, uh, in which he studied, he measured more than 100 people with the AMI device and other uh, newer uh, subtle energy uh, correlate devices uh, and uh, is finding uh, very nice results. I know that one of your faculty members there is Dr. Beverly Rubick, who I've interviewed several times about uh, bioenergies and... Uh, Yes, Beverly Rubick's been involved with CHS since the founding of CHS, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the there were uh, a number of uh, wonderful people, luminaries, who your your listeners would be, your viewers would be uh, mm -hmm. familiar with, who were also involved in the founding of CHS. Uh, or the early part of CHS, such as uh, Dr. Stanley Krippner, mm -hmm. uh, William Tiller, uh, who uh, I think. Uh, Dr. Tiller sort of coined the term subtle energies. All of these leaders in research in this area have always been connected with 
with the uh, CHS's mission. I knew Dr. Tiller when he was the chairman of the Material Science Department at Stanford University, a very eminent scientist who has gone into the field of subtle energies and uh, made some real breakthroughs, which incidentally are described by Beverly Rubick in one of my interviews with her, which I can link to right now. Uh, if viewers are interested, they just click on the upper right-hand corner of the screen and they we, uh, can watch that Beverly Rubick interview. Uh, but back to Dr. Motoyama, one of his unique contributions was the integration of an understanding of the ancient Hindu notion of chakras with the Chinese notion of the acupuncture meridians. That's right. That's right. So uh, his his book uh, Theories of the Chakras is where he he works out that integration. And, uh, absolutely, that's a, uh, an example of the integral, integrative approach and, uh, seminal, uh, integrative approach that Dr. Motiyama applied to both scientific research and education. And, and I gather it's not just some sort of theoretical speculation that I can map a, overlay a map of consciousness produced in India with one produced in China. He actually had empirical data suggesting a relationship between these systems. Yes, yes. His method was always focused on wanting to gather the, uh, the empirical evidence to uh, back up these theories. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, things I wrote about years ago was his study of advanced yogis and advanced meditators. He, because he himself was one, he, he had a, a group of people he identified as having their chakras opened, and he began doing uh, measurements of them using his device. And um, as I recall, one of his findings is that the people who are uh, more advanced in yogic meditation meditative practices, not based on the years of their practice, but based on his intuition about the opening of their chakras, that the, the measurements he found on those individuals, I guess you could say, were more volatile, more I expressive. The, 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 you could say these people were more flexible, but you might also say that they were more um, subject to uh, extreme changes. More active, more active chi energy system yeah. generally, yeah, and that was a key part of his method uh, and his his uh, interest because he himself uh, practiced uh, yogic methods uh, from an early, a relatively early age, mm -hmm. and and he experienced uh, awakening of the energetic systems in the body, much along the lines that the ancient texts describe, mm -hmm. and so that motivated him. He was also scientifically minded as a young man, so yeah. that motivated him to get advanced degrees both in uh, an MA in physiology and in uh, philosophy and religion, and combine the two in a quest to bring out, to investigate, and uh, make the community aware of evidence that verifies these energetic systems of the body. In your writings about Dr. Motoyama, you compare him to uh, some well-known integral thinkers, people like Sri Aurobindo or the American philosopher Ken Wilber. I suggest in my writing that uh, we can see Dr. Motoyama's uh, principles, eight principles for the founding mission of CIHS as an independently developed integral paradigm uh, that's on a par with uh, other integral paradigms uh, developed, for example, by Ken Wilber and Sri Aurobindo and uh, British philosopher Roy Bhaskar. Uh, this uh, fundamental mission to integrate uh, empirical science and uh, uh, spiritual intuition and uh, and human development, uh, developmental growth, uh, together into a, uh, a map and method for investigating reality. You're the president of the institute that Dr. Motoyama founded. Uh, and I understand that you're very close to achieving uh, regional accreditation through uh, WASC, the major uh, regional Western Association of Schools and Colleges that uh, does accredits all of the uh, colleges on the West Coast. That's a big step. Yes, 
Yes, uh, CHS was granted the status of candidate for accreditation July 2018, and we have our next site visit, re- seeking the accreditation site visit coming up uh, in March uh, 5th. And the uh, status of candidate, uh, you can see CHS listed on the WASC website with the status, uh, and, and it means that uh, uh, with the previous site visit, the WASCA determined that CHS uh, uh, is likely to be able to achieve full accreditation within the next five years, and we have mm-hmm. the next chance coming up very soon. It might happen even sooner. Who knows? We're hopeful. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as to my knowledge, there aren't very many you know, colleges, universities where somebody can study a concept like subtle energy. Uh, we think CHS is essentially unique in that regard. Mm-hmm. There are other other graduate schools that uh, have programs uh, uh, studying spirituality, of course, and uh, even uh, uh, some uh, people studying parapsychology. Mm-hmm. But as far as a whole institute uh, focused on the the integrative scientific subtle energy spiritual aspect integrative approach, we see CHS is kind of unique in that regard. Mm-hmm. And you offer uh, a variety of degrees, a doctoral degree, a master's degree, and even a bachelor's degree completion program? Yes, we have master's and PhDs programs and a uh, bachelor's completion. Mm-hmm. In, and the master's and PhDs are in three basic uh, departments, psychology and uh, integral health and comparative religion and philosophy. Mm-hmm. So it's a very unique school in, in that re- a small school. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's unique and it's uh, founded on Motiyama's uh, principles and uh, mission for the school. And uh, so it's also also unique in that sense. And with the accreditation, uh, we are maintaining the uniqueness, but also integrating it mm-hmm. into uh, broader integral education vision generally. I know that the accreditation process for any college is extremely rigorous, especially these days because, you know, there are uh, places, um, the schools that have offered degrees that have turned out to be practically worthless. So, uh, there's enormous pressure on accreditation agencies not to allow that to happen and, and to make uh, schools such as yours jump through many hoops in order to get accredited. It is it is very rigorous. It is very rigorous, uh, but uh, it's actually it's actually good because mm-hmm. the things that WASC uh, requires the institute to demonstrate and do actually help us become a better institution as well. So yeah. uh, that's uh, I'm being honest. I'm just being nice to WASC right here. <laughs> <laughs> so. Dr. Motoyama, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, was uh, amongst his other many credentials as, as a yogi, was a Shinto priest. That's right. Yes, he was, he was the head priest of a uh, Shinto religious organization in Japan called Tamamitsu Jinja. And uh, actually in Japan, it's classified as a new religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, there are many new religions in the general system general Shinto system in Japan, mm-hmm. uh, but it's the uh, Tamamitsu religion in uh, Shinto system. But it, as a religion, it's uh, very integrative. Uh, uh, I encourage uh, you can go to the Tamamitsu Jinja website. And they have a they have an English uh, version now, and uh, the description there you'll see how how integrative, religiously uh, combinatorial it is. How it, how it's a very integrative approach. I gather that th- there was some connection between this religious organization and the founding of uh, the California Institute of Human Science. Yes, yes. Well, uh, Dr. Motima was, was head priest of the religious organization the whole time he was working on the developing the creation of CIHS. And uh, very generously, uh, the Jinja donated uh, land and buildings and uh, financial support. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I know from our discussions that uh, uh, there is an openness to uh, all of the spiritual traditions of the world. It's not as if this is an institution promoting that particular religion. That's right. It's very much uh, CHS is very much universalistic in its uh, mindset and approach, and that's why we use the term integral or integrative mm-hmm. and inclusive. I like that also about the uh, the Tamamitsu Jinja religion as well. It's you'll see you'll see that they 
the, the current head priest, Dr. Motoyama's son, uh, is very integrative and integral mm-hmm. in approach. Uh, so was Motoyama then the, the founder of that uh, new religion? Well, his mother, his spiritual mother, a woman known in Japan as Odaisama, was the founder of that. And uh, she identified, she discovered Hiroshi Motoyama at a young age mm-hmm. uh, and adopted him. Uh, to become the uh, next head priest of the religion. She was a very well-known uh, uh, priest, priestess uh, in, in, in uh, the religion and, and also a, a kind of a shamanistic practitioner. Mm-hmm. And her, her clients included like, people very high up in the government and that sort of thing. Oh, I see. And uh, she, she recognized Hiroshi as a, as a boy, to become her successor and adopted him uh, with the permission of, of Hiroshi's biological mother. Oh. So he was raised by two mothers, uh, the, the first uh, founding priestess of the Tamamitsu uh, religion and uh, his biological mother. How interesting. Yeah. Now, probably many of our viewers uh, really don't know uh, anything about Shinto. It's, uh, it's a Japanese, a native religion to Japan, but it's not really spoken of much when we talk about world religions like Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam, Judaism or Christianity. Motoyama thought of the, the religion uh, Tamamitsu Jinja as inclusive of those other great religions that you mm-hmm. mentioned. I actually asked him about that once. Uh, uh, when I was working closely and regularly with him, uh, uh, well, how how should I introduce you? Are are, are you a Shinto priest? Uh, is and he would say, um, uh, no, no, it's more than that. Uh, uh, Shintoism is is mainly concerned with the tribes of the emperor. So uh, he was very integrative and 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 bringing together in his approach. What little I know of Shinto is that it had to do something with the uh, Japanese belief that their emperor was a godlike figure. His approach really really transcended that. So, in the sense of recognizing that humans can become godlike through development, mm-hmm. uh, uh, his approach was inclusive of that, but also uh, very much globally oriented. Do you know anything about his other contributions to parapsychology? He founded a uh, organization that he called the Institute for the International Association for Religion and Parapsychology that is centered at his uh, uh, organization in Japan. Out in the, on, uh, it's a temple on a beautiful lake in Inokashira Park on the outskirts of Tokyo. Uh, and so just through that, uh, uh, he was... Uh, very much encouraging and always uh, investigating new developments in the field of parapsychology. I, I gather that, uh, you know, when I founded this video channel, the idea was because I had a unique doctoral diploma in parapsychology and I had a vision of parapsychology different than, say, the Rhinian vision, which is basically we'll take the techniques of experimental psychology and apply them to card guessing and dice throwing experiments. Very important. But my vision was that parapsychology has a history going back thousands of years and can be found in every culture. And I, I gather that Motoyama had a very similar vision. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, he, he really, uh, uh, th- through, uh, integrating the, uh, ancient traditions of, uh, Indian Ayurvedic system with the Chakra Nadi system and the traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture and meridian system, which are, which are ancient, uh, traditions and, and systems. Uh, he, he really connected modern parapsychology with these ancient methods and systems. Mm-hmm. Well, Thomas Brophy, this has been a very interesting discussion about a very important person who, who is, I suppose, you know, not as well known as, as he might be. And I, I hope that this video will encourage people to look into his work more and to look into uh, the work of uh, your university, the California Institute of Human Sciences. Uh, thank you. I know this will be uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful to get the information out about the important work that's been going, uh, going on in there. Well, area. thank you very much for being with me. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us.
Thank you.